Well, g'day Curd Nerds. Uh, welcome to another video. This one's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be in a webinar style and I've titled it a Cheese Making 101. So as you can see there, uh, we've got a lovely title page <laughs> and uh, it's going to be all the basics for cheese making that you were probably afraid to ask. So let me go through. Uh, I'm not sure how this is going, how long it's going to run for, but uh, let's step our way through the presentation. And I've got a lot of content to deliver to you today. So, what will you learn today? Uh, you'll learn why I make cheese. You'll learn the basics of cheese making and ingredients, uh, basic equipment, uh, methods, and types of cheese and I've got some additional resources at the end of the presentation. So why I make cheese? Well, I don't know how many of you knew, I grew up on a dairy farm in uh, Loxton, North South Australia. Now the dairy farm's long gone, it's no longer there, uh, but uh, I have fond childhood memories of shoveling uh, cow manure at the end of every day and cleaning up the, uh, the dairy yard. Uh, where dad used to do the milking. Anyway, we never grew, uh, so we never made cheese because uh, that uh, cheese making technique was never passed down to us. Now, we did, however, have a lot of raw milk and I drank that consistently uh, up until about the age of 16. So no ill effects as long as you drink it within the first 24 hours. Uh, well, within the first three days, usually it's it's good to go. So we had fresh raw milk all the time uh, with no issues. Obviously, being a dairy, Dad had certain standards that he had to um, adhere to. But uh, the closest thing we came to making cheese was making butter. And I remember fond memories of my mother making butter in our, our kitchen. Um, now, I took... The uh, uh, reason I started making cheese was because I wanted to know what went into my food. I was going through um, a lifestyle change. We changed to a more sustainable lifestyle and I was making preserves. We had chickens for eggs, uh, lots of vegetables in the garden. Uh, lots of, I planted lots of fruit trees, which have only just now come to, um, uh, to bear fruit um, or good, decent amounts of fruit. So, um, so I decided to start making my own uh, my own cheese. Now to do that I went and took a course and the very first cheese ever made was feta and uh, since that cheese I've gone on to make over 70 different cheeses at home with just some basic equipment uh, nothing too fancy and we'll talk about equipment in the equipment section. So I loved uh, making cheese so much that uh, I just wanted to share it with others uh, so I created a cheese making blog, uh, a cheese making podcast YouTube channel and wrote an ebook, um, which also we have a bound copy. Um, and I've also made a an online beginners cheese making course, so uh, that's pretty cool as well. Um, moving right along, the very first thing you need to learn about with any cheese making or any food um, that has milk as its basis, uh, it's deemed to be a high risk food. Uh, very first thing that you need to do is uh, sanitization. So sanitization, you need to make sure that uh, all of your equipment is well washed first and you can run it through a dishwasher um, on a normal um, cycle. Uh, and then you need to sanitize the equipment either by boiling if it's stainless steel, um, steaming if, uh, if that's your preference. You can use white vinegar on plastic equipment or you can use a weak bleach solution which is uh, sodium hypochlorite. Now, if you do decide to use a weak bleach solution, um, this will kill the majority of the bugs, as will vinegar. And by bugs, I mean um, bad bacteria and uh, unwanted molds and yeasts. Um, what you need to do is to, um, you need to add two tablespoons of bleach uh, into four liters of tap water. Soak all your equipment for five minutes and then remove and rinse with cold water. Uh, and then don't forget around your uh, cheese making area that you should thoroughly wipe um, all of the surfaces that may come in contact with the cheese 
um, as you're making it. So that's all kitchen benches, your kitchen sink, uh, your cheese press, all that sort of stuff. Either wipe that with the weak bleach, bleach solution or with, uh, with white vinegar, straight white vinegar in a spray bottle. Uh, and that's what I tend to use is the white vinegar and haven't had any issues with contamination. So the basic steps of cheese making. So step one, you've got your milk, obviously, uh, and you bring that up to a temperature. Also, uh, you would then next add a starter culture. This is for the vast majority of cheeses. Then you coagulate it somehow, either using acid or rennet. Uh, then we stir the curd. Um, uh, sorry, we cut the curd and then we stir it. Uh, and then we mill the cheese uh, if necessary. Uh, and then we press the cheese if necessary and then age it and we eat it. So they're the very basic steps of cheese making. So let's talk about milk, which is the first um, obviously essential ingredient. So raw milk, uh, you can use that for cheese making. There's uh, no issues with that at all. However, just be aware that food standards in Australia anyway um, have a mandate that the curds must be cooked at 48 degrees Celsius, which is 118 Fahrenheit or higher during the treat cheese making process and that the final cheese ripening is at uh, 10 degrees Celsius or 50 Fahrenheit for longer than 60 days to destroy any harmful pathogens. Uh, it's therefore here in Australia only suitable for hard cheeses like Romano, Parmesan, um, possibly uh, some of the Alpine cheeses that have high temperatures as well. Uh, so those sorts of cheeses are suitable according to Australian food laws uh, for raw milk. However, there are other milks that you can use. Obviously, any pasteurised milk um, is, uh, is okay for making cheese. However, it does kill some of the uh, starter bacteria that is present in raw milk and you need to make sure that you add a starter culture uh, when you're using pasteurized milk. I tend to use pasteurized unhomogenized milk, uh, which is uh, very suitable. I can get that readily from a dairy producer uh, here locally. Also, uh, you can use pasteurized homogenized milk. Uh, you need to make sure that you add in uh, some calcium chloride, which is a mineral salt, and that helps set the curd. Make sure that uh, any milk you get has a butterfat content of about 3.25 or higher. Uh, you'll get a decent yield out of your cheese. And the other milks that you shouldn't use are ultra-pasteurized and UHT milk. They will not set a curd. doesn't matter how hard you try, so uh, you'll be at a loss and you'll just simply waste that milk. Uh, so just check out on the back of the cartons or bottles for ultra-pasteurized milk uh, and UHTs usually packed in a Tetra Packs, uh, which are um, cardboard cartons, silver lined with um, with a, a aluminium foil or something like that. So just make sure you don't use those milks for cheese making. Now, starter cultures come in a couple of varieties. Uh, there's mesophilic starter culture. Uh, which is a low temperature bacteria that uh, you don't heat any higher than 39 Celsius or 102 Fahrenheit. It's used for cheddar style, kefili, gouda or gouda, uh, feta and other semi-hard cheeses. Uh, anything that is a low cooked temperature cheese. So it likes the temperature to be about 32 degrees Celsius. Thermophilic starter culture, on the other hand, can survive up to 55 degrees Celsius or 132 Fahrenheit and is used for hard Italian cheeses or Swiss type cheeses like Parmesan, Romano, uh, Emmentaler, uh, Leodama, Jarlsberg, those sort of styles cheeses uh, can uh, readily um, be cooked to high temperatures um, and uh, therefore they use the thermophilic starter culture. Uh, the next one I'm going to cover is basically molds. So there are three main sort of molds that you use to make cheese, and that's Penicillium candidum, which is a white mold used for brie and camembert. Geotrichum candidum, which gives you a uh, an earthy flavour. It's um, it's used for some white mold ripened cheeses. Uh, and last but not least is Penicillium roque forty, 
which is a blue-green mould used for Stilton and blue cheeses like Gorgonzola or Roquefort. Um, so you only use little bits of the starter cultures. So we're talking about about an eighth of a teaspoon per 10 litres of milk, depending on the manufacturer. Uh, and uh, it what the basics of the starter cultures do are uh, they convert lactose, which is the sugar in milk, into lactic acid. So coagulation and renneting. A rennet comes in two forms, two main forms these days, and that's animal rennet and vegetable rennet. The animal rennet comes from the fourth stomach of an unweaned ruminant, uh, cow, sheep or goat, um, and the enzyme within the the stomach wall is called chymosin. There's actually two, it's chymosin and pepsin. However, we mainly extract chymosin because pepsin adds a bittering agent to the to the cheese. So chymosin is the uh, the chemical that's the enzyme that's used. Um, it curdles the milk uh, produced by their mother to aid digestion, and it's taken from a slain animal. Um, so those of you who are vegetarians and vegans, um, I would not uh, use animal rennet. Um, most of my cheeses I use vegetarian rennet uh, and it's made from a, a mould or a mycelium called Murah Mihai. Um, this contains chymosin as well which is the same as the animal form. So liquid rennet is stored in the refrigerator um, whether it be in liquid or tablets and tablets are stored in the freezer and both forms are mixed with about a quarter of a cup or 60 millilitres of non-chlorinated water and they're added to milk after ripening uh, with the starter culture. So, uh, cutting the curd and stirring. There's a couple of methods uh, on all of the uh, cheese making videos. You can see the method I use. Always check for a clean break. I either use my pinky or a knife that I push into the curd and then turn it uh, perpendicular and just lift it up. Um, and cutting curds, I use a curd knife. Uh, to do the vertical cuts and a, a curd cutting harp like the one shown in the presentation there uh, to do the horizontal cuts. It doesn't take long, um, but you need to have different size curds for different uh, types of cheese. So the smaller the curd size, the harder the cheese is going to be and maybe possibly crumbly as well. Uh, the larger the curd size, the more moisture the cheese is going to have in it. So milling is done in most uh, semi-hard to hard cheeses and it's in the process of mixing the salt with the curds. Um, salt is an essential ingredient of cheese, of course, it expels whey, slows down conversion of lactose to lactic acid and preserves the cheese. It also adds flavor, helps uh, form the rind. Um, it also inhibits the lactic bacterial growth. So the starter cultures in the later uh, stages of the cheese making process slows them right down so they don't run away and convert all that lactose to lactic acid and make it really acidic and sharp. Um, salt can also be added um, it, during the milling process where you mill the curds before you pop it into your uh, into your cheese basket. However, you can, after pressing, uh, use a saturated brine solution, about 18% saturated brine solution, and uh, and bathe it for uh, many hours. Usually it's between uh, 6 and 12 hours, sometimes up to 24, depending on the density and the size of the cheese that you've made. Uh, at that stage, milling, you can also add herbs and spices, uh, and there are many cheeses where you add herbs and spices during the milling process. So pressing, uh, we need to press semi-hard and hard cheeses uh, so that they form a closed rind uh, and that the cheese develops within that rind. Uh, there are various, various shapes, moulds for making cheese that can be pressed and you need to apply weight depending on the type of cheese. Also, you'll notice in one of the pictures down here, you'll see that there is a thing called a follower and a follower is essential to form a nice even surface on top of the cheese uh, that's not touching the basket. Uh, there are various types of cheese presses, uh, from a simple spring one like this one here um, to a Dutch press. There's a sample there and another sample here where people are getting very clever uh, using weights 
uh, in the form of uh, water bottles or uh, vinegar bottles, what have you. And um, uh, yeah, they're pressing their cheese there. Very inge ingenuity. Very ingenious. That's the word I was looking for. Okay. So on to aging. Um, aging cheese. Soft cheeses rarely need aging and can be eaten straight away. Usually within 14 days before mold growth starts. So you need to eat your soft cheeses straight away. Semi-hard to hard cheeses. You mature them at a temperature range between 7 and 13, which is 44 uh, to 55 Fahrenheit um, at a fairly high relative humidity between 75 and 95 percent all depending on the recipe that you have uh, you may need artificial cooling um, for instance a cheese fridge however a basement if your basement is cold enough uh, then that may suffice small wine fridges that you can uh, control the temperature of uh, they work as well and you can put a bowl of water in the bottom with a sponge in it um, or something protruding out of the water and that increases the humidity. Or you can use a small bar fridge, which I have converted to, um, using an external thermostat. So that works very well. Um, make sure that uh, you've got a thermometer and a hygrometer in the cheese fridge so you can monitor the relative humidity and the temperature during the aging process. Uh, one thing that's not on the page is that uh, you don't need to control the relative humidity of the entire fridge. Uh, if you use ripening boxes, which are just plastic boxes, plastic tubs with uh, an elevated floor, then you don't need to worry about um, increasing the humidity in the entire fridge. Uh, just by having a damp cloth underneath the mat that you place the cheese on um, elevates the humidity up to acceptable levels. So the times for maturation um, are stated in all the recipes. You can, it can be as little as three weeks uh, for cheeses like Kefili um, or uh, Bel Paese, or it can be as long as a year for some cheddars, parmesans and romanos um, in a small form. So eating, don't forget when you eat your cheese that you should serve it at room temperature. The, the worst, it's not worst, the biggest mistake that people make when they uh, set out a cheese platter is they take it straight from the fridge. Cheese needs to come up to room temperature and it enhances the flavour of the cheese. So just make sure when you have a cheese platter, next time allow at least 30 minutes for the cheese to come up to uh, room temperature so you get the full flavour of that cheese. Now as far as a cheese board goes, just make sure that you have cheeses from all the different cheese types, which I'll go through in a second, um, and that enhances and balances your cheese board. Um, so there's a little bit of cheese there for everybody. Okay, so different types of methods uh, of making cheese. There are soft cheeses. They're usually uh, small cheeses and have high moisture content. The curds are drained slowly by gravity and without any pressure. Uh, they are quick to ripen and require smaller quantities of milk. Curds can be formed by either adding vinegar, lemon juice or vinegar uh, and, or small amounts of rennet. Um, it depends on the recipe. Some soft cheeses are whole milk ricotta, mozzarella, whey ricotta and cream cheese and of course goat's cream cheese which is called sherv. Now semi-hard cheeses on the other hand take longer to ripen than soft cheeses and can take over five hours to make from milk to mold. The quality of the milk is greater, um, sometimes requiring at least eight litres of milk. Um, I now use standard recipes of about 10 litres of milk. They mainly require some pressing and some additional equipment. Some semi-hard cheeses are uh, Farmhouse Cheddar, Monterey Jack, Wensleydale, and most of the Cheddar family. Now, hard cheeses, uh, most of them use thermophilic starter cultures uh, because they need a higher cooking temperature. Uh, they require a lot of pressing um, and some additional equipment. Uh, longer aging periods, usually between 10 months and two years. And some examples of Parmesan, Romano and Emmental. And finally, uh, mould ripened cheeses are not pressed as a rule. Uh, they tend to develop their shape under their own weight, assisted by gravity. 
Mold ripened cheeses need to mature it in their own ripening boxes to stop cross-contamination uh, with other cheeses in your cheese fridge. And some mold ripened cheeses, uh, uh, Stilton, uh, blue cheeses, Camembert, Brie, um, and uh, Roquefort, uh, and uh, Gorgonzola are some good examples of blue ripened, mold ripened cheeses. Okay, just some examples. This uh, got some lovely pictures here to share. Uh, Cotswold, one of my wife's favourites. That's uh, chives and onions are added during the milling process, and it's the essential ingredient in what's known as a ploughman's lunch. Drunken cow is a cheese that is marinated in red wine, sweet red wine, or it can be any red wine, uh, and then it's aged, and it has a, a delicious flavour. Uh, some of the wine soaks into the rind of the cheese and it tastes absolutely amazing. Feta, uh, it's made a couple of ways. You can make a cow's milk feta uh, with the addition of lipase. You can use goat's milk. Or the traditional method of making feta from grease is 70% sheep's milk and 30% goat's milk. Uh, but feta is very simple to make, uh, very easy and you can eat it within uh, three or four days. So absolutely delicious. Halloumi is a nice, uh, a nice simple cheese to make. Uh, it's a traditional Cypriot cheese. Uh, very simple, great beginner's cheese. Uh, it can be eaten um, fried, you fry it up so it gets a nice crust, it goes golden brown. And then you can eat it with some watermelon, um, which is an amazing thing to eat with halloumi. It really does uh, tickle the taste buds. So try a bit of watermelon next time you eat some halloumi. Another simple cheese for uh, for beginners would be cream cheese. Very simple ingredients. All you need is milk uh, and no cream. I just use milk in my, my version. Turns out amazing. Milk, some rennet and some starter culture. And uh, yep, you can fancy it up at the end, uh, form it into some logs put some herbs and spices um, around the log. Um, and I've recently made a cheese ball, and there's a video on that. Uh, it's very simple to make and absolutely delicious. Another, st and I would then go on to make, say, Wensleydale. This one is uh, quite intensive, uh, but it's a good cheddar-style cheese, absolutely delicious, uh, not crumbly at all, uh, that Wensleydales I tend to make anyway. Uh, but be aware that it does take about nine hours from milk to the final pressing. So it's fairly labour intensive, but it has an amazing flavour. And I've got a nice blue cheese, which would be easy to make as well. It's uh, Stilton in the style of Stilton. It has extra cream added to the milk. So it's more creamy than what a normal uh, cheese would be. And it actually does taste very amazing. Some great flavours. You've got the blue from the uh, Penicillium Roque 40, uh, and you can see the blue veining there, and it's got a nice rind all the way around. Um, and it must be matured in a, uh, a plastic container, a ripening container, if in your home cheese fridge. <clears throat> Otherwise, um, you'll get some cross-contamination. Okay, now on to cheese-making equipment. Um, a lot of these days, for beginners, it's probably best to buy a kit. Uh, and there are a lot of good cheese-making kits out there. In fact, we sell some at littlegreenworkshops.com.au, um, as well as all the ingredients and all that sort of stuff. Um, and the other essential ingredients, so if you're going to make semi-hard cheese, make sure you get yourself a press. Make sure you get yourself a kit. Um, and get some basic moulds and some cultures as well. Most of the kits have uh, all the rennet, calcium chloride, um, baskets, followers, uh, some have cheese wax in them as well. Uh, and they're very comprehensive. But uh, yeah, kits are probably the best way to go for beginners. They have full instructions, so you're not guessing uh, for your cheese making. So the very first the very first cheese you, you make, obviously you want it to be successful and you don't want to get discouraged. So kits are probably the best way to go. So that's equipment. Now, uh, cheese making courses are great fun, indeed they are, and I've taught quite a few cheese making courses now. Uh, I have since stopped face to face courses because I could only reach locals, uh, and all that 
been great and I love teaching locals, but I wanted to reach out and, uh, and teach a lot more people. So I've developed a cheese making course over at courses.littlegreenworkshops.com.au and uh, it's called the Curd Nerd Academy, the beginner's course. Uh, and uh, it's a great little course. It's got recipes and instructions on how to make nine different cheeses, all the way from the simplest to an intermediate cheese being cheddar. Uh, so if you've got cheese making courses locally to you, then I would not hesitate for you to, to go on them. And I, do, I recommend that uh, because there's nothing like um, learning from an expert on how to make basic cheeses. Um, and if you want to go up a level, then check out my online course over at courses.littlegreenworkshops.com.au. I have written a, a cheese making book, and it's called Keep Karma Make Cheese. Uh, it is very popular. It's sold over, I think it's nearly 10,000 copies now, which is absolutely fantastic. This is my first book. I'm currently writing another one, but this one's got over 25 tried and true recipes, tested them all just to make sure they work for you and there's no issues. Because uh, I find with a lot of cheese making books, the recipes haven't been tested. Uh, there are mistakes through them, so um, yeah, it's a bit of a worry. But I've tested all these ones. There's over 60 pictures, um, full color pictures within the book and links to um, cheese making videos uh, within the recipes. So as many recipes as I could, I actually linked uh, the cheese making videos within the book and you can click it. So great little addition to your cheese making library. You can also catch me um, over on Little Green Cheese podcast. We'll release an e a weekly one. I try to anyway. And uh, there are 82 episodes at the moment. Uh, and there are many uh, of the episodes are interviews with uh, home cheese makers. And uh, there are also many tips and techniques and listener questions uh, that I answer. Uh, during the show other places you can find me are my blog littlegreencheese.com and of course on youtube where this is showing uh, is uh, the direct link to that is cheeseman.tv you can always catch me there it redirects to the youtube channel anyway hopefully this has been of some information uh, to you and you've learned a little bit about the basic cheese making process uh, i've been um uh, very excited to bring this to you today. Hopefully it's been of some use. Anyway, uh, if you like this sort of thing, give it a thumbs up, leave me a comment. Um, I can do more uh, webinar sort of presentations. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed doing this and uh, and doing the slideshow and uh, presenting it to you. Well, thanks for watching Curd Nerds and we will see you next time.